with Distill Me This, where I learn and you do too, everything distilled from plant to bottle. And today I have my friend Brad, who is a wealth of knowledge. And today we are going to learn Aperitivi and Amari. And let's let's get to it. Grammar's going to do battle. This today. is going to be going smooth. from English to Italian, and I'm not Italian. Aperitivi, aperitif. Amari. Amari, amaro. Yeah. Digestive. Nice. Um, so if you're going to say amaros or aperitivos or aperitifs, we're just confused. Yeah. It's not, it's not Don't worry. Don't. Us. Yeah. Uh, so an aperitivo is just simply something that you have essentially as an appetizer before your meal. It's any drink that you have before your meal. It's designed to spark uh, digestion. Get your gastric juices yeah. going. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, typically, if you're in Italy, especially if you're anywhere from uh, Milan down to Naples or even all the way down to the very southern tip of Italy, you're going to drink Amari and you're going to drink um, especially, you know, a red bitter cocktail of some kind okay. we'll talk about in a sec. You're going to drink that 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, maybe coming out of your nap time. <laughs> yeah, nap time, we like Spanish a little bit. Um, coming out of your nap time. As you're gathering with your family and your friends to start cooking your meal, you're having is something like an Aperol spritz, or you're gonna have something you know bubbly, slightly bitter, slightly sweet, and uh, usually very fruity. And then perfect. Then you're gonna have your wine with your meal, and then you may have another aperitivo, or the, at that point they would call it a digestivo, um, which would be usually a little sweeter and a little heavier. Okay. Uh, you'll have that after the meal again. Digestive as, as opposed to aperitif or aperitivo. So, um, well, we've got a few things right here um, yeah. that we could talk about. This um, this is Del Professor. Yeah. Uh, I researched, this is some beautiful, beautiful spirits. And um, so, you want to talk about a little bit about sure. these? You know, the reason why I wanted to get these kind of presented front and center today is I think they are the front edge of what uh, the Italian uh, aperitivo category can be. The okay. story of this is that the brand is not particularly old. It's maybe, uh, I don't have the notes in front of me, I'm sorry, it's probably 10 or 15 years old. Um, but this comes from a couple of uh, classic cocktail bartenders from Rome that have roots in uh, the Piemonte region, or Piedmont. And uh, that's where these aperitivo styles and uh, especially vermouth styles really originated and uh, gained most of its evolution. So these guys were down in Rome uh, learning about Jerry Thomas, who's the forefront, uh, the foremost kind of godfather of cocktails. Uh, they were actually at the Jerry Thomas Speakeasy, that's nice. uh, their bar, and they couldn't find a vermouth particularly that really fit what they thought was the classic style, what they thought Jerry Thomas was using when he came up with uh, many of the, the great cocktails that we know now, including the predecessor to the, the, Mar the um, excuse me, the, the Martini, mm -hmm. as well as the predecessor to the Manhattan. Oh. Um, so they wanted to try to find a way to get that classic style. The number one thing that they discovered was that nobody was using a wine base for vermouth. You oh, know, vermouth really? Is a fortified wine. Yes. So you take wine, you add a little liquor to it to kind of keep the ABV high enough where it's shelf stable, and you add ingredients, you add flavors and stuff to keep a nice kind of lively character as it sits in the bottle. So they went back to, to uh, Piedmont, uh, to the hills just outside of Turin, and uh, started looking at winemakers and looking at uh, vermouth makers, and they found this one guy. And this one guy had been making vermouth for a hundred years, but hadn't sold it. He, he wow. wasn't making it for a hundred years, but his right. family was. His family. Uh, he, ha he wasn't selling it. It was basically there's house vermouth. So they started working with him. They tweaked a little bit of the recipe so it was their own recipe and not his, but they used his classic techniques, including using wine as the base, uh, and depending nice. on the, the vermouth style, either Nebbiolo, uh, Barbera, or uh, uh, Muscat. So most um, most aperitivos or aperitivis yes. are spirit based then, is what you're... Typically. Okay. Uh, and when we're talking vermouth nowadays, they are, and they, they're usually spirit based and they add some wine in. Okay. And when we're talking uh, aperitivo, they're strictly <laughs> spirits. Okay. Uh, and typically you're going to use a neutral grain spirit or you're going to use a grape based spirit or something that's available, something that's mm -hmm. easily, readily, readily available that's not going to necessarily contribute to the flavor. 
So something neutral, you infuse flavors to that, um, and then you may add sweetener. Typically you would add some kind of sweetener, whether it's beet sugars, cane sugars, honey, anything like that. Um, but the main thing that's gonna drive it is the bitters agents. Yeah. So typically from their local farms, typically okay. from their local markets. The Del Professor line, about 90% of what they put in the bottle, they go down to the town and they buy it from the market. So it's so it's not mass produced like like other well known brands. Yeah. So you're going to get something completely unique. Um, I was looking on the website yeah. that they have this great video and it was showing you know just one mountain farm gal who right. is just picking up wild from the wild you know and it's right. kind of cool. Um, so it's on the they're on the base of the Alps, right, or something. Absolutely, like that? yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're looking so. at the Alps, they're, they're kind of right on the corner where France meets Switzerland meets yeah. Italy, and so you get this confluence of, of traditions yeah. um, already. And, and it's the at the ancient kingdom of Savoy. I mean, the, this was a powerhouse kingdom in the middle of the Middle Ages, the Savoy okay. Kingdom, uh, yeah, which stretched kind of from Marseille over to. Uh, Turin, maybe a little bit farther east from there, but of course Piedmont uh, has some of the most uh, exciting, most highly sought after wines in the world with uh, sure. Barolos and Barbarescos and, and uh, Barberas and, and Dolcettos. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, draw people for their Amari and for their Aperitivo. Most of those have ended up in the big city of Milan, about you know two hours mm -hmm. east of there. But the traditions are all from that area, okay. and the diversity is incredible, which I can show. Yeah, in just let's, a bit here. Yeah, let's so, yeah. yeah, let's let's look at these in a little bit briefly, and then we'll go on to you know what may be like them or yeah. what people might think of what they think is an aperitivi or yeah. um, a digestif or you know amaro, um, and what we can exp hopefully expand your knowledge today. Um, uh, I'm then, hoping to expand mine. Yeah, <laughs> me too. That's why we're doing this channel. Anyways, so let's let's do let's bring these over yeah. and just kind of okay. So we've got so so just from the Del Professor line, I have four of the five bottles today. We didn't grab the fifth bottle, but that's okay. So again, they started off as a vermouth brand. Vermouth is as classic an aperitivo as there is. Okay. Thank you. Long before anyone knew how to distill, they were making vermouth. All you had to do was take your wine, in this case with the Classico style, or essentially an off-dry white style. This is a style that's used between 1750 and 1830. Mm. Uh, this style was very popular, and a lot of the original cocktails that we know uh, that were using vermouth from before kind of the 1860s, 1870s region would have been calling for this Italian style vermouth. A white vermouth with a little sweetness to it. In this case, they're using muscat grapes, like we said. The only major, and they're not really a major vermouth line by any means, small batch mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, but the, the only uh, you know, brand that's being imported that uses just grapes as the base before using uh, the infusion comes from the, uh, the hard alcohol. Right. But most of the flavor is coming from the grapes specifically. So that's the classic. Very unique. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and it gives it just a beautiful flavor. Nice. Beautiful, complex. And then the, the Rosso is the same kind of process, a little bit different ingredients. Um, the Classico is going to be mildly sweet, sweetened with beet sugars, and uh, almost a savory kind of tone. Mm. You almost taste the seafood kind of influence Interesting. from the Mantra, the slow food kind of um, idea where it's complex, where it's deep, but there's a little bit of bitter and a little bit of like umami, salty kind of quality Ooh. to it. Uh, you taste a little bit of that. The Rosso, which we don't have here, uh, is a lot more rhubarb, a lot more vegetable, a lot more, uh, not much of those sweet spices. It's more of the dry roots and the dry spices on that one, and that is a Nebbiolo oh. base. So oh. Nebbiolo, again, one of the most highly sought after noble grapes yes. in the world. Um, the Kinado here, Kinado was a style that kind of came around in the early 1900s. In the late 1800s, uh, a, a lot of doctors and a lot of you know medical experts started recognizing 
the ability for a couple key herbs, particularly the quinchona bark, right? The quinchona bark, which is used in tonic, mm -hmm. which is used in, um, for instance, PEMS. PEMS, Debonet. Debonet is a great uh, example. Um, uh, there's a uh, quina called um, beer, B-Y-R-R-H, not, not beer like, you know, we found in beers. Yeah. Um, that is heavily quinchona. And uh, there's, a, you know, you may see uh, Chinachina, China, which is another yep. Amaro that mm -hmm. I don't think we've got to, I don't know if that's no. China, China, but it's a very classic, yeah. pretty, pretty well known Amaro it's out there as well. Again, high Kinchona. This product is essentially a sweet vermouth, sweet red vermouth with Kinchona bark added. Um, so, would this be something that if somebody wanted to do something before or after a meal, yeah. this would be after? Uh, typic typically, for these roots and these ingredients, we would do it before the meal. Oh, okay. However, okay. we are going to actually use this in a cocktail that will kind of display something that you can use more at the end of the meal. Oh, okay. So, that's so it really is kind of, you can kind of do, it can be before or after there's... You know what's interesting actually is, is the traditions have actually flipped oh. over the centuries. Okay. Uh, originally, these were called digestives, uh, particularly the dark uh, amari. Right. Uh, so things like fernet, things like uh, Crowder liqueurs in Germany, things like um, you know any more of these sweeter but still pretty bitter amaro would have been consumed after the meal as part of dessert, almost right. the same way that you would have espresso okay. in Italy. Okay. Right. That bitter quality. Yes. But somewhere along the way things kind of flipped and people kind of recognize actually it helps start the meal yeah. as well as it does to help cleanse the palate at the end. And it goes really well before dessert as well. Nice. So you have your big entree, big meats, big, big proteins and stuff. You have your um, heavy bitters, your espressos, your fernets and things like that. Settle the stomach and then you get your creme brulee or yeah. your, um, <laughs> your nice custard or anything, something like that coming. Okay. So that's the, uh, you know, it's kind of gone kind of everywhere. Now it's almost a free-for-all. You know, you can have it almost wherever in the meal. Okay, so basically there isn't really a, well, you got to do this one before the meal and this one after no. meal. It's really whatever you want. Because that right. was kind of confusing for me to yeah. learn that, you know, well, what is before the meal and what is after the meal? What's right. going to help me? Right. doesn't matter, I guess. Well, and, and we kind of talked about the aperitivo being that mid-afternoon kind of drink. Mm -hmm. Typically, those were would have been more of the red liqueurs, the red bitters. Got it. Which we see here. here. Okay. And so this is kind of the more Milano style. Okay. It did kind of originate, we think, in Piemont. We don't know that for sure. Cocktail history is always cocktail very... History. People wrote Bitters. cocktail history after having several cocktails. <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit questionable. But... These styles, the aperitivo, which is typically your lower alcohol, sweeter, fruitier style, or the bitter, the red bitter specifically, uh, a little bit higher alcohol, typically in the mid 20% range, and more sharp and um, almost tongue tingling. Tongue -tongue. Yeah. So, uh, not that they compare it in any lengths, as I've, but if somebody were new and all they knew was Aperol or Campari, because those are the big brands, yeah. um, this would be more kind of if they wanted something that would be like with a, if they wanted to branch out and not get yeah. Aperol, this would be what they could get? This would be one of one the of them? options. Okay. And if you're, typically what happens, what I've seen happen is people read a recipe, right? right? Which maybe we can show off a recipe in just a sec here. Yeah. You see a recipe and it calls for Aperol or yeah. it calls for an aperitivo. Mm -hmm. You can kind of flip flop any one of a certain type of category in for that. Okay. You're going to get very different results. Sure. But I think they're going to all be really fun and exciting. Nice. Even though they're going to be a little bit different. Just like if you see a daiquiri recipe right. and you have three different rums. Try your daiquiri with three different rums and watch what happens. Right. You It'll know? be a little bit different. This aperitivo is a lot more chocolates and oranges mm. to the flavors. Okay. Aperol is more like a strawberry flavor, okay. strawberry rhubarb kind of flavor. Okay. You may get like the Contrato uh, aperitivo. I believe we have that one have. over here. Um, I see the uh, Leopold Brothers 
over here, which is a Denver product. Uh, all of these have different character, different flavors. And so if you pick up a bottle, what I always say, is before you even dive into a recipe, taste it, mm -hmm. and then see what you think would go well with it. So if yeah. you're tasting it, maybe you're getting some more spicy notes. Maybe you're getting some more, um, you know, brighter citrusy notes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to use ginger ale. Maybe Good. you want to okay. use tonic, which we'll use in just a second. Good. And you can play around with different things like that. That's kind of the aperitivo category, which typically is the category where the alcohol percentage is between maybe 11, 12 percent, and maybe 18 to 19 percent. One thing I'll say when you're in that um, alcohol percentage range, you probably want to keep your, your spirit sealed and refrigerated for as long as possible. Okay. Um, it, between uses, if you're not going to use a bottle uh, within six to eight weeks or so, it's probably not good. It's, it's going to lose, lose some of its character. It's not going to go bad, but it's going to lose some of its character. Okay. Your alcohol is not high enough to keep it shelf stable. When you get up to the next category in the red bitters side, put that to the side there, we'll look at the bitter category. It's, again, it's hard to tell because these bottles are dark, but when we go to make a cocktail with it, we'll, uh, we'll be able to see. But if we bring up the other um, bitters over here, of course, Campari is the one everyone knows. Campari is one of the biggest brands in the world, but Campari owns uh, dozens of spirits brands uh, in the world. When you see that, that color is a little bit darker and it may or may not show up in the category. But these are, are heavier, a little bit less sugar, or maybe even a lot less sugar. And uh, uh, we can leave that to the side for now. Uh, these are going to be more of that bitter, sharp flavor. These are going to use more for, you know, heavy, uh, hard alcohol uh, cocktails like a Negroni, like a Boulevardier, which we'll look at a little bit later as well. Yes. Yeah. So... Imperativos, okay. these are lighter, these are more summery, these are more, they can be more floral, they can be more citrus, they can be more, um, you know, bright and playful. These are a little bit heavier, a little bit sharper, um, more bitter flavor on that. So that's okay. kind of, that's the okay. red, the Milano style. Uh, it's called the Milano style, mainly because Campari is from there, and they do have several um, brands coming from that area, but it's also, it stretches across northern Italy in general. Um, one of the big things that people ask me all the time with these is, what makes them red? Mm -hmm. well, yes. There's a couple different things. Um, it can be food coloring. You're going to want to avoid the products that use the food coloring. It won't necessarily say it. I didn't say, I didn't point to it like uh, Leslie did. Um, it yeah. won't necessarily say it on the bottle, but it may. Um, I believe the EU is actually working on requiring, requiring bottles to yeah. say it. But something like, now the Leopold Brothers does not use artificial colorings. However, it is a U.S. made product, so it doesn't have to say it. Mm -hmm. Tricky. Yes. Uh, but the classic coloring agent in all of these is the coconut beetle. Which, uh, so if you're vegan, watch out, maybe, flavored, uh, maybe colored with the beetle. Um, that's just a classic way of coloring that, that goes back hundreds, hundreds of years. Because it was used to, um, uh, I think the Spanish discovered the, the Native Americans, or the, um, I can't remember, somebody's going to correct me in the comments below, please do. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, it was used to color uh, clothes. Because, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, they discovered it. And the, I don't know how it transferred, transitioned from clothes to it's, spirits, but it's, it's a always very a human efficient. thing to it do. Doesn't, it doesn't need much. Uh, yeah. And I don't know how they, I've not been to a coconut um, extraction um, plant. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they're out there. Maybe, yeah. maybe if we go to Milan, we can uh, there you go. go check it out <laughs> if they have it there. Uh, it, but that's part of what gives it color. Uh, Del Prefessor, a lot of the color does come from, again, being from a red wine. When you look at the color, it's actually a little bit thicker and a little bit more viscous than, okay. than these are uh, because you're using a red wine. If you're looking at a Barolo at oh, red wine, it's got that that's got the, deep yeah, garnet. So. Uh, I don't know what garnet is colored. It's, it's like mm -hmm. a ruby red. It's very transparent, too. So they're not, because they're in the wine mm -hmm. base, they're really not coloring it with yeah. anything other than... They still do use the coconut. Okay. A little bit. They say they use a very tiny bit, um, basically to just color correct. Sure. 
Uh, so it is not vegan, but it has less than the others for what that's worth. Mm -hmm. But they also use beet juice for this. Perfect. So uh, Lovely. red beet juice um, is, the, is between that and the wine. That's what, where most of the color nice. comes from. Perfect. Because they tell me. So, okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the red Milanese style. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like it. And then um, from there, we can kind of talk about the heavier... Um, sweeter or, or brown styles, if you will, which typically either goes from uh, kind of three categories. You have a bitter liqueur, mm -hmm. which is much more sweetened, okay. and they do classify these, and my apologies, I don't have the classifications out um, with me as far as the amount of sugar per liter in each okay. one of these, but that's how they're classified. There's a certain cutoff um, where if you get more than a certain amount of uh, sugar, below that is a bitter liqueur. The next level is an Amaro, which means bitter okay. in Italian. And then the next level up from there, the least amount of sugar by category is Fernet. So many people have heard of Fernet Branca. Mm -hmm. I believe we have the, the Jelinek Fernet here. Yeah. Uh, maybe over here. Uh, but so we, we have that around somewhere. But so when you hear Amaro, it's going to be in that middle category. There okay. is going to be sugar in there, at least from, from some source, whether it's fruit sugars, honey sugars. Um, uh, cane sugars, okay. beet sugars, anything like that. So yeah, perfect. That's that's kind of the breakdown of what aperitivo uh, as a category is.